think what people are missing right now is how China's leapfrogging us in a lot of things. I'll, I'll give you a simple example. BYD came out with their latest sedan. The hybrid goes 2,000 kilometers on one tank of gas. You can drive from Vancouver to LA without refueling or from London to Rome without refueling. China's massive economy is confounding Western investors and distorting commodity prices across the world. Louis Gov, founder of GovCal Research and one of my favorite guests, joins us today to discuss China's influence on the price of gold, oil, copper, and other global commodities. I'm Ed D'Agostino from Malden Economics, and this is Global Macro Update. Louis, always good to see you. Thanks for joining me again here at Global Macro Update. You know, the last time we talked, it's been a while. It was back in May. Time flies. Time flies. It really does. Uh, and it just gets worse and worse, it seems. But at that time, you were talking about an anomaly that you noticed in the global marketplace, right? In global trade that that China was running a, I believe you said a $70 billion a month trade surplus. And you wondered how long that could go on. And you fast forward to today, here we are heading into the end of summer, and we're at what, $100 billion a month? It's a lot of money. I think if you take uh, the biggest Japanese trade surplus in history, and you take the biggest German trade surplus in history, and I pick these two countries because they're countries that historically have run very large surpluses, um, you, put, you take their two records, you put them together, you still don't get to $70 billion, let alone $100 billion. Um, so yes, uh, China's trade surplus uh, has accelerated a lot. It's basically Chinese trade has been the sort of the one silver lining in, in the Chinese growth story. Of course, we know about the you know the disappointing real estate, the youth unemployment, and the uh, and the the, um, uh, the frankly somewhat disappointing consumption. Um, but exports have been undeniably the the, the big bright light, and and perhaps. Um, what a lot of your listeners might might not realize, what's particularly fascinating is that today, China's exports to other emerging markets, to the broader developing world, uh, are now bigger than China's exports to the developed market, basically to Western Europe and, um, and the United States or North America. Um, so yeah, trade, China's trade is, is, is absolutely booming. You know, the, the investments that China made 10 years ago and things like the One Belt, One Road, the Silk Road Fund, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, all the things that we sort of laughed at and said, oh, you want to have trade with Kazakhstan? Aha, uh -huh, who cares? Sure, have it. You, you know, it's, it's all yours. Um, the reality is if you look at the BRICS countries, China now uh, does more trade with the BRICS countries uh, than it does with uh, the United States. Uh, so. You've uh, you've seen uh, uh, yeah a surge an absolute surge in Chinese growth. But for me, the big question is this: is as we look at the hundred billion dollars that China now you know sucks in every month, where is that money going? Now, if you go back fifteen years ago, we knew that you know if you were a widget manufacturer and you know you earn dollars, you would turn to the Chinese central bank and say, here are the dollars that I've earned. And um, here are the dollars that I've earned. Please give me some renminbi. Uh, and then the central bank would take these dollars and buy U.S. treasuries and recycle them in the U.S. Uh, this clearly isn't happening anymore. You know, all you have to do is look at the holdings of the Chinese central bank of, of treasuries uh, to see that it's, it's clearly not happening. So, you know, what are all these widget manufacturers, the guys on the other side of that trade, what are they doing with, with all this money? Um, and here, I think, you know, increasingly the answer, I think they've kept it mostly in dollars, which is why the dollar has been strong. Uh, and I think they've been trying to buy U.S. assets. You know, you, you've tried to keep your, your dollars in offshore booking centers like Hong Kong, like Cayman, like Bermuda, wherever. Um, you earn these dollars, you keep them in bank accounts there. And from there, you buy whatever's going up. And what's going up has been, you know, Microsoft, Apple, uh, and so forth, uh, the Ma the Max Seven. So I think, you know, the, it seems to be. Fifteen years ago, the trade was China ran trade surpluses. The money was recycled into U.S. Treasuries. Today, China runs trade surpluses, and I think the money has largely been recycled in Max Seven. Um, this is a hunch. It's it's a hard one to prove because a lot of that money is offshore. Um, but you know, you have to think. Okay, that's a hundred billion a month. Where where does it go? Uh, which inherently, by the way, 
means that you know the the strong dollar trade and the max seven trade are, are roughly the same trade uh, because if tomorrow for whatever reason let's say the fed is cutting or u.s growth disappoints or u.s politics turn even uglier than it already is etc for whatever reason the u.s dollar does start to roll over and right now it does feel like it's rolling over and incidentally as it rolls over max seven stops to outperform but um as the U.S. dollar starts to roll over, which seems to be what, what is unfolding right now, then do these guys on the other side of that $100 billion start to say, hold on, I, don't, I own enough at U.S. assets already. I don't want to own any more. I am earning all this money. Maybe I recycle it somewhere else. Um, and perhaps that's what's already happening. And perhaps what they're recycling it now is gold. You know, gold, gold is moving up every day. Gold is one of the few assets... That's making new all-time highs, although that's not exactly true because the Dow Jones is also making new all-time highs. Um, but you know, if you look at assets around the world that are making new all-time highs, you've got the Dow, you've got gold, and you've got Chinese government bonds. That's it. Those are the three asset classes that are making new all-time highs in U.S. dollar terms t today. Um, so you know, if now the U.S. dollar starts to weaken... You know, the, the big question, which I think is a distinct possibility as we start an easing cycle from the Fed, the big question is where does that $100 billion start to get? Does it continue to get recycled at max seven or does it start to go other places? The bulk of the trade, this, that this $100 billion a month trade surplus, is it happening primarily in dollars? Great question. Uh, no. And that's been a, a key change for, for China. Uh, you know, China now has roughly about as much trade that it settles in renminbi as it does in u.s dollars uh so, so wow. that's that's a, a, a very profound shift and of course the huge catalyst to that shift you know if you'd gone back three years ago the amount settled in renminbi was a tiny fraction of the amount settled in u.s dollars but you know three years ago or two and a half years ago we kicked russia out of the dollar system and russia therefore had no choice but to move to non-Western currencies. And uh, the more obvious non-Western currency for Russia to trade in became the renminbi. So all of the natural gas trade, all of the oil trade, all of the coal, the iron ore, anything that Russia could sell to China, and it's, there's a lot, because you know basically everything Russia produces, China wants, um, then all of a sudden that shifted from being priced in US dollars to being priced in renminbi. Uh, that was a huge boon for, for China. You know, having the ability to pay for your commodity needs in your own currency is an absolute game changer because you can always print your own currency. Uh, and if you've got somebody on the other side who's basically, you know, you've got them over a barrel, they, they don't have a choice but to accept your currency, um, that leaves you with, with tremendous power. So, you know, the reality, of course, is when we kicked Russia out of the Western trading system, we grew, the big winner was China. We, we gave China a, a huge uh, shot in the arm, which perhaps helps explain why all of the, the cataclysmic um, bearish scenarios on China never materialized. Why, you know, you're not going to get to see a Michael Lewis book on hedge fund managers who made a fortune uh, shorting China, because even though the stock market went down, you know, the stock market went down by two thirds in five years. And the real estate market went down by a third, uh, roughly, over those five years. Uh, the reality is that the Chinese economy has continued to hum along. Uh, not at the growth rates of the past, um, but the economy didn't implode. Uh, and this is something I often talk about with people. I often say, look, imagine if in the U.S. the stock market went down by two-thirds and real estate went down by a third, you know. What would movie sales look like? What would restaurant sales look like? What would car sales look like? Uh, the interesting thing is in China, all of these things are hitting all-time highs. Um, now, I'm pretty sure if the stock market was down by two-thirds and, uh, and real estate down by a third, car sales in the U.S. would not be hitting all-time highs. Neither would restaurant sales. The economy would look like a big black hole. It would be a balance sheet of, of epic proportions. Now, granted... Part of the, that is the fact that as an economy, the U.S. economy is massively financialized. You know, you have a, a stock market that uh, today, if you take the U.S. stock market, 55 trillion or so dollars in market cap. Um, 
And if you take the private sector GDP, I always think that GDP is such a weird measure because if you increase your government debt, you increase your GDP, but you know, it doesn't mean you create growth. Um, so if you take the US GDP, roughly 28 trillion, you take out the, uh, the, the, the roughly 10 trillion of government, it leaves you with an $18 trillion private sector GDP. Today, in the US, you have a stock market that's three times the private sector GDP. So that's why when the stock market goes up or down, it does have a big impact. It's the tail wagging the dog now. You know, the stock market is now so much bigger than the GDP that when the stock market goes down, it impacts the GDP instead of the other way around. Um, and the, in, in China, you know, the, 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 the relationship was never like this. Um, you know, in China, only 10% of people own stocks. In the U.S., 70% of people own stocks. So if tomorrow the U.S. stock market goes down two-thirds, 70% of people feel very poor. In China, the stock market goes down two thirds. Ninety percent of people don't care. Um, so it's a very, very different, uh, you know, uh, backdrop for uh, you know for, for for how things work. But it does tell you an important thing: is that you know when the economy becomes so over financialized as it is in the U.S., um, you know, having a two thirds drop in stock market in the U.S. I think as a policy choice is impossible. It's just not possible. So what we have in China, stock market goes down two thirds and every foreign investor is jumping up and down saying, why doesn't the government do more? Why doesn't the government do more? And the answer is the government doesn't do more because only 10% of people own stocks and it doesn't really matter. You know, most companies don't fund themselves through, through equities where the equity settle doesn't have that much of an impact on, on, on growth. Uh, completely different, of course, than the U.S. Again, the U.S. stock market goes down by two thirds. It's a nuclear meltdown in the economy. What is driving China's economy and, and where do the risks lie? Because if you are now exporting $100 billion a month, right, that is your economy, right? It's, it, is a, it is an economy that is dependent on exports. Absolutely. And, and we're you know, in this multipolar world. Um, I keep saying it. I don't, I, I, I'm going to be proven a jerk, I think, in the end, baby. But there's this quest for resiliency, I think among the US government and the Chinese government. And, and that resiliency means depending less on each other, at least for critical things like commodities. There's a quest to depend less on each other between the US and China, no doubt about it. But again, I'll come back to the fact that China now exports more to emerging markets than it does to uh, developed markets. So, uh, you know, when I started in this business, um, one of my very first clients told me, Look, Louis, in this, in this business, you can choose to have a boss or you can choose to have clients. Uh, the good thing about having clients is you can have a lot of them. So if you lose one of them, it's not the end of the world. Um, also, if you don't like one of them, you know, you, you don't have to pay attention to them. But if you don't like your boss, you know, the, things get tough. Now, <laughs> if you compare China's situation today to China's situation in 2008, in 2008, most of China's trade was going to the U.S. So the U.S. blows up and then Chinese growth blows up and they find out, okay, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you have 18 million workers that lose their jobs overnight and they have to do all this infrastructure spending and, and you know, just funnel a lot of money into public works projects to, to keep people employed um, because they had, you know, they thought they had a client, but in reality, they had a boss because when you only have one client, what you have is a boss. Um, and so, the, the, you know, in this quest for resiliency, you want to move from one client, i.e. the United States, to thousands, or there's not thousands of countries, but to hundreds of clients. Um, and, and, you know, China has accomplished this quite nicely over the, past, uh, uh, over the past 10 years. And so when you look at China's massive trade surplus, which is, again, the silver lining today to China's growth, um, then, you know, you find out that it's actually with, with a bunch of different countries. Um, so it's far less dependent on any one relationship uh, that, than, than it was in the past. Now, to your point, you know, what does Chinese growth depend on? Uh, you know, 10 years ago, people were saying, oh, Chinese growth, it all depends on real estate. And if they lose that, then the economy is going to implode and it's going to be terrible, etc. Um, and, and back then, Chinese growth was all dependent on real estate. And they did lose that. Uh, it was a policy choice. They said, you know what? This growth is imbalanced. Uh, it's creating social tensions. Young people can't house themselves. 
It's creating uh, all these political problems, you know, riots in Hong Kong. We don't want those kinds of issues to come into Beijing and Shanghai. So we're going to crack down on real estate. Um, and they did. You know, they cracked down really hard. Uh, they, you know, a lot of property developers went bust. And a lot of, there was a lot of forced selling of a lot of inventory. And it's still going on today. Um, and yet the economy didn't implode because over the same period, um, what China did was register tremendous productivity gains in manufacturing. Um, and here I, I really think that people who haven't visited China in the past five years have missed this story. Um, now, very few people have visited China in the past five years because, you know, first you had the COVID lockdown starting in 2020. Then after that, you know, China supports Russia uh, once Russia invades Ukraine and everybody decides China's uninvestable. I'm not going to waste my time going there. Plus, the stock market stinks. Um, they're going through a massive balance sheet uh, recession. Property developers are all going bust. You know, why am I going to bother going there? Um, China's dead. The story's over. Meanwhile, over that period, what do we find out? We find out that China comes from nowhere to be the biggest car exporter in the world. Literally nowhere. Like five years ago, China was not exporting cars. And now China, you may remember the charts I showed at the Malden conference in May, but um, China is now the biggest car exporter in the world, the biggest solar panel exporters. It's exporting turbines. It's exporting, um, you know, earth moving equipment, uh, tractors, I mean, building roads, building high speed railways all across basically all these emerging markets. Um, and I think that's, to be honest, that, that's, that's the part that, that people have missed is the productivity gains that have occurred in China's manufacturing are, are simply, simply mind blowing. Um, and I think one of the reasons they've missed it is inherently one, one of our core beliefs in the Western world is, yeah, you know what, China can copy, they can churn out pale imitations at a cheap price. You know, the, the Chinese business model, we invent in the West, then they'll copy it and they'll do, a, a, you know, a somewhat shoddy job of it. They'll do a product that's like 85% as good for 70% of the price or, you know, that, because for 25 years, that was the case. That, that, that's what happened. And I think what people are missing right now is how China's leapfrogging us in a lot of things. I'll, I'll give you a simple example. A couple months ago, you know, BYD came out with their, their latest sedan, uh, you know, think a car, basically the same size as a Toyota Corolla, um, the BYD Dolphin. The, the hybrid goes 2,000 kilometers on one tank of gas. You know, you can drive from Vancouver to LA without refueling or from London to Rome without refueling. Wow. Um, you know, this is revolutionary stuff. It, it raises the question of, do I even want to buy an electric car? You know, most people drive 10,000 kilometers a year. That means you fill up your car five times in a year. Um, you know, it's like, do I, maybe I don't even bother buying an electric car. You know, if I only need to fill up five times. It, uh, and that car, by the way, retails for 14,000 US dollars in, um, in, in China. Um, and they're, ex you know, they're not exporting it yet because the demand in China is so high for it. You know, what's the point of exporting when we can't even produce them fast enough for our domestic market? Um, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that is unfolding right now. So, yes, you know, China, I think, has evolved from being an economy that was all about real estate, uh, you know, five, ten years ago, up to, to up to about five years ago, to an economy right now that is all about exports. But it doesn't mean that five years from now, China will still always be about exports. By then, it might have evolved again. It might be all about consumption. It might be all about real estate again, although I doubt it. Um, you know, we'll see. But um, I think what we have to do is keep an open mind and accept that this is an economy that is evolving very, very rapidly, in part because of the, the incentive structures that, that, that are put in place. Um, you know, the, the reality in China is, you know, five years ago, you had 20, 30 automakers. And since then, a bunch of them have gone bust, um, which is so... If you're an entrepreneur in China, you got to run fast or you die, um, which is something that I think we've forgotten about in the West. Let me ask you this. Um, when was what was the last big Western bankruptcy? So here we are, you know, we're the hallmarks of capitalism. We're right. We're as capitalist as we get. I, I can name you 10 Chinese bankruptcies over the past three, four years uh, of automakers, of solar panel manufacturers, of 
um, of real estate developers, etc. Uh, here we are in the Western world, whether in France, in the UK, in, in the US, and we pat ourselves on the back about how capitalist we are, about, you know, we're red-blooded capitalists, etc. When was the last big bankruptcy? And it, that is are a we, yeah, phenomenal are we, point. Are we capitalist if nobody ever goes bust? Like, how, how does that work? How does capitalism work without bankruptcy? It's like Christianity without hell. You know, the, the concept doesn't work. What do you say to the argument uh, from, from, from both the Europeans and the North Americans that uh, uh, that the Chinese subsidize their car industry to such an extent that they're now able to deliver these these cheaper goods, substantially cheaper than, than we could possibly produce, so it has to be subsidized? Yes, there's the big subsidies in China, but I don't think people understand how they work. Um, now, first, of course... Let's not pretend they're like Tesla and like live off subsidies for, for its first 10 years of its existence. Huge subsidy. And, that, and that's kind of my point is when I looked at the reviews of a lot of the new, the new Chinese cars that are coming out, both electric and hybrid, they're awesome. So in the U.S., the way the subsidies work or in Europe is we, we subsidize a business so that, you know, you end up at the end of the day with a Tesla that costs $70,000 so that Elon Musk can be a quadrillion billionaire or whatever the number is. Um, he can like be, be massively wealthy. Um, so in China, the way the subsidies work is somewhat different. And the way capitalism works is, is very different. The way it works is you have somebody at the top, like a Xi Jinping, who says, guys, electric vehicle is the future. We need to do electric vehicles. And that's all he says. Then what happens is every provincial governor every mayor of a big town, every party secretary of a province who wants to get ahead thinks, okay, if Xi Jinping will like me, if I manage to generate in my region, city, province, a national champion on electric cars. So what happens then is that because of capital controls, because of the financial uh, repression in China, basically most of China's savings, which are massive, are in the banking system. So then what happens is every, um, every bank, like every provincial bank is told, hey, you need to lend money to ABC car company or to XYZ car company or to BYD car company. So all the car companies, then you have like 30 or 40 car companies in China who are all of a sudden all cash rich. They, are like, they, they got access to credit because the government said, this is the sector we wanna be in. And then the Hunger Games start. Like literally, these guys, like you got 40 guys, and they're going to just throw money at being the best, knowing that only two or three of them will survive. Um, and it is, it is just, just a Hunger Game. And you could say, well, all this is basically subsidized by you know, unfairly priced credit from, from the banks, because you know, a lot, out of those 40, 38 will go bad, and so the banks will take the hit. Um, and so that's how the, the, the Chinese su subsidies work. But, you know, it's not like Xi Jinping is sitting in his office looking at different car designs and saying, yeah, this car design is good. We'll subsidize this one. And this car design is bad. Uh, so can this one. That's not the way it works. It's everybody gets funded and then it's the Hunger Games. Um, and at the, end of, at the end of it all, what you end up with is you don't end up uh, with uh, Elon Musk, who's made 100 or $200 billion what, uh, and produces $70,000 cars, you end up with a BYD that produces sub $10,000 cars and a Chinese population that can all of a sudden aff afford cars uh, and a Chinese car market that's now the biggest car market in the world by a factor of two. Chinese economy and, and government structure, in some ways, are more beneficial to a middle class than the country that invented the middle class. I think they favor, they definitely favor competition more. Um, you know, you know, in, in, in the U S you know, do you, in, in which sector do you say, would you say you have the most competition today in, in the U S um, you know, in competition that it continues to drive down prices to the point where companies go bankrupt. Uh, you definitely don't see that in healthcare. Uh, one of the biggest sectors in the economy, I would Trading. argue, Trade, trading and ETFs, right? Yeah, yeah, no, you see it in finance. No, but you're right. You do see it in finance. Uh, you do see it in finance. 
partly because the barriers to entry and finance are pretty low, right? You and I tomorrow could go out and, and set up a hedge fund at a fairly you know, low price or we could, you know, the barriers to entry and finance are, are pretty low. So you're right. It still does happen in, in finance. And by the way, that's probably the one sector in China where it does not happen um, because of regulation, because, you know, because of financial repression, because the Chinese system, the way it's built, is basically dependent on this ability to capture the savings um, and, you know, create a bunch of Hunger Games episodes uh, for for various uh, for various industries, um, so but you know you you look at the U.S. You know your 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 agricultural sector is dominated by three guys. Your uh, you know you go sector after sector, um, there is no competition. Ever since the great financial crisis, right, oh eight oh nine, well, it's been bigger is better. Well, it's been bigger is better, and I think the big lesson of oh eight oh nine was we're not going to let anybody go bankrupt ever again. Like we let Lehman go bankrupt and that turned out to be a disaster. So God forbid, nobody goes bankrupt now. And if that means keeping the cost of capital at zero to make sure people don't go bankrupt, we'll do that. If that means giving subsidies, we'll do that. If that means blowing out budget deficits and sending checks to everybody in the mail, we'll do that. Um, but absolutely, God forbid that anybody go bankrupt because... You know, that, that would just be uncapitalist. It would be un-American if anybody went bust. Yeah, they would have lost their job, right? That'd be, that'd be damn right un-American. You know, we could, go, <laughs> we could keep going on this, but I want to make sure that I get with you on commodities because sure. that's, a, that's a big area that I think a lot of people are going to be interested in. And we've been sort of talking about different areas of market distortion, right? And I think that this, the what China is doing versus what the U.S. is doing and Russia is doing are all having big distortions on commodity markets. Can you we talk a little bit about that? I mean, is is China strategically hoarding certain commodities um, to, and and to set the price, or what what's happening with things like copper and and oil? So first, let me say, you know, I think when I, we spoke in May at the Malden conference, I, I was, you know, quite optimistic on, on commodities, partly because I was decently optimistic on China, partly because I was very optimistic on global growth, and especially optimistic on the broader emerging market growth. And, you know, since mid-May, um, you know, right now I've got a lot of egg on my face, because since mid-May, uh, all the cyclicals in the world have gotten smoked. Commodities first and foremost, you know, you mentioned copper, but it's true of uranium, it's true of energy. It's true of energy stocks. Uh, basically, anything that wasn't gold. I mean, even silver has been like disappointing since mid-May. Um, and forget platinum and palladium. Like anything that wasn't gold since mid-May. And if it's commodities, pretty much anything. I'm sure you could say, okay, orange juice is up, etc. But whatever. Um, everything since mid-May and anything that really has anything to do with the economic cycle has indeed been disappointing. Um, and yeah, it does. Be, and frankly, this against a geopolitical backdrop, that's, you know, I think more harrowing by the day, um, you know, you know, be, between the Middle East situation, uh, between Ukrainian troops moving into Russia, basically, you know, raising the level of temperature, you know, any one of these things you would have thought, you know, could, you know, frankly, you know, <laughs> At least put a bit on oil. Exactly. I would not think oil would be below $75. And I would think U.S. producers would be a lot higher than they are. All that's been super, super disappointing. Um, so, you know, why is that? So you could say, okay, well, Chinese growth has been disappointing. But Chinese growth has been disappointing for a while. Um, so hasn't gotten that much worse? I, I, I don't really think so. It's basically been on a you know subdued trend for, for a while. So then we get to your question. You know, is China, you know, using build up stocks to, you know, manipulate prices? Um, and, you know, we do know that during the COVID years, when China was, you know, doing nothing because it was locked down, because it was, China kept importing tons of oil, tons of copper, tons of iron ore. So very clearly it must, it built up inventories then. Um, so I think, you know, for years and years, China was a price taker because it, it didn't have much choice. But now I think it has built enough 
strategic reserves in a lot of things that if prices run up too much, they just back off. It's like, oh, um, and and if prices dip enough, then they come back into the market and, and buy it back. Um, so that gives you, and perhaps that's what's been happening in oil, right? You look at the past 18 months, oil has sort of been range trading. It's now... So it means that I think if you're investing in the commodities and the physical commodities themselves, that's super frustrating, right? You're going nowhere. You're burning premium. You're, but logically, this should be a pretty decent environment for commodity producers. You're like a lot of oil companies will tell you, hey, if oil prices stay between seventy-five and eighty-five, you know, we're making tons of cash flows. We're like cash flow generating machines. We can dish out dividends. We can buy back our stocks, um, like. You know, so if you're long the WTI contract or the Brent contract, you're very frustrated. Logically, you know, if you think oil stays between 75, 85, 75, China buys, 85, China stops buying. You know, I, I, I don't see why that's bearish oil stocks. I think it's super bullish oil stocks because in that kind of environment, nobody's adding capacity, um, really. And, you know, and these guys, again, are typically generating pretty hefty cash flows at those prices. Or most of them agreed. Are. Like companies like Devon Energy. I mean, it's, it's one. It's one of my favorites. Yeah. Uh, and yet, the price just doesn't reflect it. No. Great dividend. Great operation. Well-run well company. So you say, okay, these guys Can't are. Catch a bid. Yeah, these guys are. You know, right now, energy is towards the lower band of a, a lower, you know, lower trading band, and a lot of the energy stocks have derated. So, you know, you you buy them here. You know, oil prices get back to 90 bucks. You you sell them again, and you just have to keep keep doing that. Um, or you just say, you know what? I don't care. Over the next five years, I know I'm going to make lots of money on dividends. I know I'm going to make lots of money on share buybacks. So just I'll buy those and go to the beach. Uh, and I think that also works. So let's talk about some other areas of the world. Uh, sure. there's a, <laughs> I mean, there's so much going on. It's, it's fascinating from a macro perspective, but it's also... I mean, the level of complexity uh, just seems to be near near all time highs. Um, you you mentioned before we started rolling that there's a lot happening in France, especially lately. T- tell me a little bit about that. There's a lot happening. Well, first we had a great Olympics. Uh, we we had a great Olympics. It was super fun. Uh, no no terrorist incidents, as a lot of people feared. Um, and frankly, the level of security that was deployed was was, was super impressive. So. So on that front, you know, that, that, that's good news. Um, the bad news is really more on the political front, where we have a country that's now divided uh, between th- more or less three equal poles, between the center, the far left, and the, and the right, the populist right. Um, and three blocks that kind of hate each other, uh, where, you know, reaching compromises seems to, be, seems to be impossible. So here we are, you know, we, right now we have, you know, the, the old government that has absolutely no legitimacy because they just lost the election, uh, and no ability to put in a new government that would, um, you know, get a majority of, of of parliament. Now, the reason this matters is that the European Union told France that by the end of this year they needed to shave 25 billion euros off of off of their current budget. Um, and right now we don't have any political leaders, you know, proposing okay, let's cut defense or let's cut education or let's cut pensions or whatever. Like something needs to be cut. Um, and, but more importantly, we need to propose, we being France, because I say we because I'm French, um, we need to propose in September a budget to the European Union. Um, and now that budget is more, <laughs> it's like right now we don't even have a government to propose the budget, but whatever we propose, it's most likely going to be rejected because we didn't even do the 25 billion of euros of savings for 2024 that we were supposed to. You know, you, you look at this and we're going to come to a standoff between France, who doesn't have a government, and a European Union that I think is getting more and more frustrated with France's inability to deliver the kind of rigorous budgets that everybody else in Europe is doing. You know, you look at Italy, you look at Spain, you look at Portugal, like all these countries, they tighten their belt, um, and France just refuses to do so. Uh, now, I get it. We're friends. You know, we're bigger, we're better, we're stronger uh, and more handsome. So maybe we get away with it. But uh, but I, I fear I fear it might not be. I fear that this time 
uh, where we're coming in. Then you get to the second problem is even if the EU says, okay, fine, whatever, you guys want to keep spending, just go for it. Um, you still get to then to the, the problem is who's going to buy all this debt. Uh, and here, this is, this is a genuine problem for France in that uh, France is basically in the same situation Greece was back in 2011, where m now more than a third of the debt is owned by foreigners. Um, and, you know, domestics always buy their domestic debt, like local banks buy their debt and local insurance companies buy their debt because, you know, regulations and, you know, th that's just what you do. Um, but once you become dependent on the funding of foreigners, you risk that at some point the foreigners come in and say, hold on, you know, do I want to own French debt? You know, where's their government? Um, you know, what if there's riots in the streets in the fall because of proposed cuts? Um, riots in the streets, by the way, when all the policemen, you know, all, every French policeman was in Paris for the Olympics. Um, so now, you know, usually you get time off in the summer. They're all going to get time off in the fall. Um, fall is usually when there's riots. We're going to have riots without the policemen. Um, so... I, I think there's, there's this sort of risk uh, uh, emanating around France that, that perhaps the market is being a little too comfortable with, partly because it's like, oh, we've seen this before with Italy, with Portugal, with Greece, and at the end of the day, things always work out and the ECB steps in, etc. But, you know, it's, the numbers keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and the French numbers are pretty darn big. Yeah, and France is not Portugal or Greece when it comes to size of the economy. No, that's right. Well, we as as Americans, I'm American, we are doing everything we can to help the French economy um, by way of Boeing. The, <laughs> no, that is, you know, it's, it's actually interesting because this summer, if you look through the tourism numbers, Spain, Italy, Greece, they had monster summers. France, not so much. I think everybody stayed away out of the fear of Olympics. Um, everybody, like the Olympics... Tourism-wise, were a dud. Like the events were great, uh, the organization was very good, etc. But in terms of revenue, it's been it was a disaster. Like like Paris was a ghost town. This was the year you wanted to visit Paris. You could you had the museums to yourself. You had it was an awesome summer to be in Paris. It was really truly truly terrific. But uh, not if you were running a restaurant in Paris or a hotel. Uh, then it was a bit of a disaster. So. Uh, to, to your point, you know, the number of American tourists you see everywhere today is mind blowing, which is another indication for me that the U.S. dollar is overvalued. You know, when you when you walk around some small village in Spain in the middle of nowhere and there's a bunch of Americans who, you know, you're like, wow, OK, They're like so far off the beaten path. It's um, it's yeah, it's a testimony to the strong dollar and to how weak all the other currencies are. Uh, and by the way, uh, I was looking at the tourism numbers into the U.S., uh, and they were very weak this past summer. Uh, like foreigners didn't come to the U.S. The U.S. has just gotten too expensive. Um, the U.S. is now a very, very expensive place to visit. The rest of the world is very cheap. Speaking of uh, weak currencies, um, let's let's take a stop in Japan. Sure. Well, it's not that weak anymore. Right. So that's the, that's the story, right? It, it has been getting stronger. But do you think that that trend continues? Yeah, look, uh, you mentioned that the Chinese trade surplus is one of the big anomalies in the world. The, yeah, I think in, uh, in, in our talk back in May, I mentioned that for me, one of the biggest anomalies in the world was the yen at 160. Um, you know, the, the yen at 160, uh, it, it was just simply ridiculous. Um, you know, you could... You could get a top-notch meal in Tokyo uh, for less than 25 bucks a head, when in New York, for that amount of money, you don't even get a slice of pizza anymore. Um, so, no, no, Tokyo, uh, Japan at 160 was, was a bargain. Now, granted, at like 143 or wherever we are today, it's not the bargain it was two months ago, um, but it's still a bargain. Like 143 is actually still cheap on the yen. Um, and I would... Imagine that what we're going to continue seeing is an improvement in the U.S. Uh, sorry, in the Japanese trade balances, um, because at 143, a lot of Japanese companies remain extremely, extremely competitive. 
do you think that that continues? Because you know, there was a time in 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 this country where uh, we thought that Japan was going to take the country over, right? The yeah. uh, trophy real estate was being was being bought, and um, uh, you know, Japanese cars were were taking over, and then the Japanese stock market collapsed. Will the yen continue to rise? I think it will. Uh, I think it will. To be honest, I think we've started. Uh, We've started a downturn on the uh, on the U.S. dollar, but just just because of you know shrinking interest rate differentials, you know, the Bank of Japan was extremely extremely slow to raise rates, but but they've now started raising rates very slowly. Uh, but you know they've had to because inflation is now a politically sensitive issue in Japan. Uh, you, you know you have to remember that Japan is a much older society than the United States than than pretty much any country out there, um, and. While inflation is fine for young people because typically wages follow inflation and, and you can work harder and make money, et cetera, uh, inflation is a killer for pensioners. I mean, it's, a, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's devastating. Um, now, you know, Japan is an old country. So politically, uh, you know, inflation just caused the prime minister his job. You know, Japan the, is... The been, irony of after so long of them trying to create inflation. Yeah. The, uh, well, here's the, here's the funny. I mean, I think a lot of Japanese pensioners, you know, they kept voting the LDP back in, etc., because fundamentally they were fine with deflation. Again, if you're on a pension, deflation is happy days. Right. <laughs> it's, right. Right. it's like it's right. it's That's awesome. A great point. Um, and and so now I think that part, uh, you know, inflation is is politically sensitive in Japan. It's just caused the prime minister his job. I think you will see higher interest rates in Japan. Meanwhile, in the United States, we've now started, I mean, Jack, uh, Jackson Hole, uh, Powell, you know, for all intents and purposes, signaled that he's cutting in September. Um, so, you know, just because of the interest rate differential, yeah, I think, I think the yen's heading higher from here. So we've covered a lot of ground, and I don't want to take too much of your time, Louis, but you're the definition of a global investor in my mind. So what do you like? Where, we, I, not, we don't have to get into specifics, but just in general, where are you thinking that there are opportunities right now? First, thanks, thanks for having me and the kind words, and, and it's, it's always good to catch oh. up. My friend Kevin Weir likes to, to talk about it. You know, the, he, he writes a newsletter called the, the Macro Tourist, and it's a great read. And he, he likes to talk about series of rolling bubbles. You know, we, we seem to go from bubble to bubble over the past because we've injected so much liquidity into the system that, you know, we had a big fixed income bubble, and then we had a crypto bubble, and then the meme stock bubble, and then a Max 7 bubble, and then an artificial intelligence bubble. Um, and, you know, so you, you, I've been scratching my head thinking, oh, you know, what, what's the next big bubble? Now, if you'd asked me back in May, I, I was all gung-ho on commodities. And, and to be honest, I still am. I, I still think that we've underinvested uh, in the extraction of a lot of the commodities that we will need. And I still think that one of what people underestimate um, is how quickly China is helping countries like Vietnam like Mexico, like uh, Indonesia or others, pick any one of them, or Bangladesh, or uh, helping these countries industrialize on the cheap and on credit. Uh, you know, it's giving these guys canals and satellites and uh, telecom systems and machine tools. Um, and as they do, you know, you get rises in disposable incomes as countries industrialize and people want to buy motorbikes and they buy cars. Um, and we're not talking about 100 million people here, but we're talking about two, three billion people who in the coming years are going to start buying refrigerators, buying microwaves, buying cars, buying motorbikes. And I, you know, we've written a lot of pieces about the, the upcoming boom across the Indian Ocean, the upcoming boom across Southeast Asia, across parts of Africa. And I, I still think that people underestimate that you know the the drain on commodities that all this will represent uh you know the demand for oil for copper for for iron ore for for everything so i i do remain a bull on commodities um but you know it was a whole lot easier to be a bull on commodities in may when all the prices were going your way than than it is today where i feel like i got a ton of egg on my face uh and where you know i feel like like i look at my own portfolio and i feel like everything's been on fire for the past three months uh, and it's been and it's been pretty brutal uh, now. So you know when when things are not going uh, your way, you always have to say, okay, you know what am I missing? Uh, you know, being an investor is a little bit being schizophrenic, right? You you 
you like go one way and then you have to th- say, okay, this is what I believe now. Let's forget all this. And what am I missing? Yeah. Um, you have to and, be able to change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So you're like, okay, what am I missing? So is, you know, is there a U.S. recession coming? Uh, Am I wrong about growth in emerging markets? I really don't think I'm wrong about growth in emerging markets because I do travel around a lot in emerging markets. You know, I, I spend a lot of my time on the road and I go to Latin America, I go to Africa, I travel a lot across Southeast Asia. I'm heading back, in fact, into Africa in six weeks. I'm back in, um, back in Southeast Asia next week. But, and everywhere I go, I see it. I mean, it's just like, it, it's blindingly obvious to me. Uh, you know, it's more cars and it's Chinese tractors and, it's so you see it everywhere so i don't think i'm wrong on this so then it's like okay am i wrong on a u.s recession about to unfold uh because if there isn't a recession about to unfold i think commodities come right back pretty quickly for what it's worth i agree with you Um, (laughs) well good thank you if if (laughs) it's painful it's been a painful my money is where my mouth is (laughs) it has been a painful three months but you know at the same time if uh if you're looking to put money to work it's a better time than it was three months ago that's right louis always fascinating speaking with you really appreciate the time absolutely my pleasure so much fun